Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday, and welcome to our 2021 edition of Multiple X Venture Capital Conference hosted by London Business School. I'm Evgenia, LBS MBA 2021, a senior chair of the conference and a VC investor at Nielsen Ventures. I'm very excited to kick off the venture capital part of the conference and introduce our keynote speaker, David Tatton, founder of Versatile Venture Capital, investor, founder, and author. Hi, David. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Thank you for being with us. Our today's topic is best practices for increasing private equity and venture capital backed portfolio company value. We'll have about 30 minutes of David's presentation and 20 minutes of the Q&A session with the audience. Please submit your questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom. And we have a special surprise for those who ask the most upvoted questions. You can upvote a question by clicking the thumbs up icon. David, thank you so much for being here. Before we dive into the topic, could you tell us a little bit more about your background and the story behind Versatile Venture Capital, please? Sure, so I've been, uh, I was a serial FinTech entrepreneur and then I was a partner at two different VC firms in New York, FF Venture Capital and Hoff Capital and uh, recently have launched Versatile Venture Capital. Uh, we are uh, specializing in capital efficient companies with particular interest in fintech and sales tech. So it's more at versatilevt.com, but let me skip the ad and jump to the content because that's probably why you came. Sure, that is really interesting and fascinating. We know you have been doing a lot of research on the value creation uh, resources, levers and strategies that PNVC investors can use. Could you please share with us uh, your findings? Will do, that's today's discussion. So first off, I'm gonna go through this presentation at high speed. Uh, this is a result of an in-depth research study. Uh, no need to take notes, go text your parents because uh, you can get this full slide deck at tedden.com slash PA. Uh, I'm, what I'm gonna do here is give you a lot of the color for our research. So when I was in business school, one of the frustrations of business school and undergrad, although I really enjoyed my education, is you do your work, you turn your paper, your professor skims and then throws it away. And I always look for opportunities to try and leverage my work. So uh, this research that you're gonna see today is the result of a partnership between me and three Columbia MBAs who had the same logic. So they conducted under my supervision, a research study on the topic of how can investors increase portfolio company value. Instead of just submitting to the professor and throwing it away, uh, we published it. It became the most read uh, article of the year in the journal of private equity. Uh, we also featured in TechCrunch and a lot of other publications. So I think it had more impact than most student research. So one question I know we're gonna have is how students can engage with the VC industry. And this is an obvious one I wanna highlight is look for opportunities to work on projects and leverage the platform of the VCs to get a broader distribution. So today I'm gonna to talk about different levers to enhance portfolio company value, the three types of investors and how you can assess yourself as an investor for purposes of figuring out how you can add the most value to your companies. Let me start with the highlights of our research. So we found a strong correlation between a well-developed platform model, platform meaning your set of resources to increase portfolio company value and returns. We acknowledge that there's a bit of circularity there because platforms cost money, right? So the successful firms have more money around the, the firm in order to pay for staff but the nice thing is it's a virtuous cycle, right? If you have a better platform that lowers your origination costs, more companies wanna work with you and you can boost returns. We found that the most popular and valued categories to support are direct customer intros, cause that's revenues, community, recruiting, capital raising, board service, uh, and access to vendors. Board service you'll notice is not at the number one uh, because with due respect to my fellow VCs, your ability to add value in a every other month board meeting for two hours is perhaps smaller than your ability to add value through lots of other arms and legs that you as a firm might develop. Uh, there's a lot of different models, which we're gonna go into. Unlike in the private equity industry, virtually every VC does this for free for the companies with the intent of capturing the value by virtue of the fact that the, the value goes up. It is striking to me that in the lending industry, you don't see this. I know virtually no lenders with platforms, even though the lending industry uh, also has a challenge of origination and in fact has a well-developed standard model for paying for origination. So my three co-authors uh, were uh, Adham Abdel Fattah, Kuhn Brenner, and Georgi Beslig, Buslig uh, from Egypt, Holland, and uh, Hungary respectively, so a very international team. And our research 
drew on our background as consultants, uh, as investors, and as entrepreneurs. We were looking at this issue of how can we help the companies, how can we do it systematically and scalably, and then how can we self-assess? By the way, feel free to interject questions as we go along. Uh, I will try and address them during the presentation, but we also have time for Q&A afterward. So our sources, we interviewed over 50 different investors. We looked through a variety of industry databases to understand headcount allocation, uh, and of course, our personal experience. So the point I wanna emphasize here, I'll tell you a story from my first day in business school. So we walked in and we were having a case study about an ice cream company. And the professor had a box of ice cream uh, sandwiches and he handed out and said, okay, anyone wants to grab it. So a number of students grabbed ice cream sandwiches. I didn't, don't like too much sugar. And we're all eating them. And he says, okay, first lesson of business school, there is no free lunch. And then he cold called all the students who ate the ice cream sandwiches. So in fact, I will disagree with my esteemed professor. There are two free lunches in investing. The first is diversification, right? Which will predictably increase your risk adjusted returns. And the other is platform. So that's why I'm so fascinated in platform. One of the things that challenges me about the public market investing is you put on your trade and what can you do, right? You can pray, you can hedge, you can sell and get out. But other than that, you can't really do much. But in the world of private companies, you can actually bump the roulette table and increase your odds. That's exciting to me. So we developed a seven part framework because of course we're consultants. So we have to make lists with cool acronyms. A seven part framework for the different ways in which you as an investor can enhance portfolio company returns. And I'm gonna break down some of the levers from, for each of these seven uh, levers. So first is team, the T in top scan. So a number of VCs aggregate job openings. They're vendors that help you do that. So for example, at my old firm, we encourage all of our companies to list their openings on jazzhr.com, which we're an investor in, and we developed a tool to just scrape that into our website. And our logic was the Portcos have typically a much smaller brand than we do, right? So if we can help funnel talent to them, that's helpful to them. We also help companies in their recruiting. We would coach them on how to interview. Most people think they're good at interviewing, but they're actually not. There's significant academic research in this showing that people are actually quite bad at interviewing unless they have proper training. Uh, some firms use on-staff recruiters. Uh, the, one of the firms that does this, Primary VC, says they found their callback rates are four times higher when you call and say, hi, I'm a recruiter with a VC firm, as opposed to, hi, I'm a recruiter with a tech startup you haven't heard of, right? So that makes the recruiter's job a lot easier. Uh, I know another VC that says when they invest, we will give you X number of qualified candidates, and if we don't, right, then we lose some of the warrants that we negotiated. So they're backing that up with a, a KPI. Uh, also, I've been in the situation of calling up candidates and saying, here's why I invested. I really believe in this company. And this is why I think it's a great move for you to join this company. Another set of tools are to lower their headcount needs by helping second interns to the companies or by providing targeted support, which we'll get to momentarily. One of the errors that I find management teams often make is they hire people they know, right? They hire their friend from business school, their friend from kindergarten, whatever. And that can work well, right? But the problem is most of us develop our friends because of chance, right? You were in the same school, same club, whatever, and you have common interests, and that's awesome. But the person you went to school with is not necessarily, and in fact, it would be illogical to assume that is the best qualified person for a given job. This is one of the reasons why the industry tends to hire homogeneously, um, but you are inherently limiting your talent pool when you do this, right? Because you're not mounting a thorough search for the best qualified person for a given job who mathematically is almost certainly not someone you already know. I recognize there's value in some pre-existing trust, but I will take the more qualified person with whom I will build new trust over the existing person with whom I don't have historical trust because hopefully I and she will competently build trust together. Your best friend, your spouse, they all started as strangers, so it is certainly doable. One of the models I really like is when you help to develop a career track across the portfolio, one of the risks of startup companies is they're not stable platforms, right? They can blow up, they can have significant layoffs, happens all the time. At Welsh Carson, which is a prominent later stage investor, they advertise on the website that 50% of their port co management teams previously worked at another Welsh Carson company. So what they're saying is, if you get a job as a controller at company one, and you want to be CFO, and that your path head is blocked because the CFO is 
32 years old, not going anywhere, no problem. We'll help you find another CFO gig at another one of our perk codes, and you get some career benefit because we'll refer you, right? We've been keeping an eye on you. We can say you did good work. So this is the modern equivalent of making your career through different divisions of GE. In the modern world, fewer people work for GE or another huge conglomerate and route through that ecosystem. But if you're working with a well-established venture capital private equity firm and they're thoughtful about this, you can synthetically replicate that sort of career track. So the next is operational, helping them in their operational processes. So at my prior firms, we developed a pool of pre-vetted consultants and service providers. We invested in a company called Founder Suite, which also has such a network. Uh, we ne pre-negotiated discounts with them. And we also found enhanced leverage. When you as a small company go to a law firm or another service provider and ask them to do work for you, inherently they know if they screw up, What's the penalty? They're not going to get further work from an unprofitable company, which is probably going to go bust because most companies fail. You don't really have leverage. But if they know you were referred in by the parent entity, right, by the firm, they know they have, they're have they being held accountable. And they're not going to get further business from our Kiretsu if they don't do good work for our port co. So that's, I think, a really low-cost way that you can enhance your impact. Uh, a current issue in the COVID era is helping to allocate real estate efficiently for example, as companies scale up and down, figuring out who can sublet from whom, assuming you have an office. I know it's old school to some people do that. Um, at my old firm, FF Venture Capital, we found a consistent pattern that Porcos were usually not great at financial controls and financial modeling. Strangely enough, most tech startup founders are not accountants by training. And so we would get financial models which showed revenue of this in year one, stair step, revenue of this year two, stair step, year three, right, which is not the way companies actually grow. We would get balance sheets that didn't balance. And we said, this is ridiculous, right? This is not good corporate hygiene if your financials are not in order. So we developed an in-house team that provided outsourced CFO services to companies. We charged for that at cost. It was expensive, so we had to charge something, but we charged at cost, meaning 30% below market, because uh, that avoided the conflict of interest between the GP and the LP, the general partner and the limited partner. We ended up spinning off that business, graphicfinancial.com, and that was eventually acquired by Kiwi Tech. And that was extremely helpful to us because although we never mandated it, no one was obliged to use the service, we knew that the companies were going to be would have their numbers in order, and it made it more attractive for later on investors to invest in our companies because they knew that the companies had their house in order as opposed to having their financials in a shoebox, which happens more than you might like uh, in early stage companies. Uh, so the next uh, component of our framework is P, perspective. So most obviously is through board service. Um, there is a VC firm that has developed a pool of MBA consultants. So they'll say, okay, you wanna do a competitive analysis, boom, here's a team of two MBAs, we'll do the work for you gratis because they wanna build the connectivity of the VC. Uh, I think that's certainly helpful. I definitely acknowledge in my prior experience as a founder with two exits, I definitely made some stupid mistakes because I was in the heat of battle, right? I didn't have this outsider's perspective of understanding the broader dynamics. Is this really a good move, right? I'm completely guilty. And so that's certainly helpful when the investor can look in a more neutral and dispassionate way. What I find in the world of investing, especially startups, is when it's your company, it's your baby. So you look at your baby and you say, cute, cuddly, sweet, adorable. When I look at it, I say red, wrinkled, screaming, right? I'm more neutral about your baby. So that's healthy because I've news to you, most babies are red and wrinkled and screaming. They're also cute and cuddly and wonderful, but you know, they have their moments. So a couple of other levers here, uh, content. First Run Capital has an amazing job with this. Uh, they also have a search engine on their website for uh, reviewing the best vetted content, different topics. There's also a website, askanything.vc, which aggregates all the VC blogs, which is great because you can find really high quality content, whatever topic you're perusing. Uh, at First Round Capital, they've also developed a in-house uh, team to help you in your pitching for raising your next round, because that's such a fundamental skill in the world of VC. Uh, at Primary VC, they developed an in-house expert network, specifically not C-level CEO level executives. They said the typical founder doesn't get concrete help by talking with other founders 
right? They need help on their marketing plan, their financial plan. So let's get some great marketers, some great financial people, some great product people, and let's cook them up with the, the entrepreneurs. And they'll provide very specific coaching, either to the CEO or to the next level down. So common dynamic, you have some 25-year-old junior product person. If they're getting mentored by a 35-year-old more experienced product person, that can be a really good dynamic. Uh, another model, EIR. So my firm, we have one EIR right now, Adam Abdel Fattah, my co-author from this research. Uh, and that's a great model for um, helping them get off the ground in a company even before you invest. We haven't yet invested in Adham's company, but of course we hope to. There's no legal obligation on our side or his. There's just a gentleman's agreement that when he's at a point of raising, he'll reach out to us and if we like it, we'll invest. Uh, and lastly, functional classes. How do you develop certain specific skills? Sort of a mini on-demand MBA. So I'm an advisor to Real Ventures in Canada, which is the most active early stage VC in Canada. They run a two-day founder camp every six months. And all the founders who receive funding in the trailing six months attend that camp. The goal is to get some economies of scale and teaching founder skills, build connectivity with the partners, because all the content is taught by the partners of the firm. And they're trying to build a community model. Uh, this is one of the fundamental insights of First Run Capital is they want to be a, a hub uh, for founders, but as much as possible, help people route directly to one another. One of the problems of the traditional model of you as the investor being the source of all knowledge is you're not scalable. But with a community model, every new company enhances the value of the whole Kiretsu, right? So I really like that approach. Uh, Real Ventures also has developed a focus on growing the founders as people, not just their business. No surprise, companies reflect the strengths and weaknesses of their founders. And their research has found that founders need three key attributes to scale, self-awareness, personal accountability, authenticity, and transparency. And they coach founders on those specific skills. It might not be specifically the partner, because as you can imagine, it can be awkward to have your board member coaching you on things like how personally accountable you are. They're, that's delicate. But they have a network of outside coaches who can help with them. And they've invested 300K in their own team's personal development, which gives you an idea of how seriously they take this. Next is customers. So I literally like this because, to quote one of my former bosses, revenue cures all ills. And Dreesen Horwitz does a great job with this. They hold, uh, I believe, north of a um, uh, thousand meetings a year between large corporates and their portcos. So their sales pitch is: you work for Siemens, G, some large, some large corporate. You want to understand innovation. Come to Silicon Valley. We'll set you up with a dozen meetings with relevant companies. Hopefully, you'll become clients, and it's free to you. That's a great deal. All costs money, but very attractive to the corporate, some of whom might become LPs, and to the, the startups that get the opportunity to engage with senior corporates. Another model is analytics, another lever. So uh, at my old firm, we set up a portfolio dashboard with IPRIO to track the metrics around all the companies. For example, we made a report called Months of Cash Remaining, and every month we'd say, okay, these are the companies that have the least cash remaining what do we do about that? We knew that those were situations where we either had to say, they're going to die, that is what it is, let's prepare for death um, and put them in the hospice, uh, or let's extend them a bridge, help them raise in the next round, whatever was appropriate given that situation. So that's certainly critical. Uh, next is network. So I've published research on the use of technology by private equity and VC firms. It is usually pretty pathetic. Uh, for many private equity firms, their tech stack is Excel and Salesforce.com and Outlook, so the bar is low. I've spoken with some top 10 private equity funds who don't even have a firm-wide CRM that all the partners adhere to. Instead, each partner has his or her own database. That is definitely not best practice. So I encourage you to make sure that everyone in the firm uses a CRM. Tell the junior people, we track your work in the CRM. If there's no data they are showing you've been calling a meeting, we assume you did no work, and that will be reflected in your bonus right, because you really need to track this data. Uh, at my old firm, we developed a database of the areas of interest for different ladder round investors, and I was the point person on reaching out to all the series A, B, C investors saying, hey, here are the two companies in our portfolio that best fit your interest can intro you, right? So I was an unpaid investment banker on behalf of the companies. Uh, we, uh, the alumni network is a hugely powerful tool. Y Combinator has one of the best. Uh, one of my friends who went through YC said that the biggest value he received was not the capital, but lifelong membership in a book face. 
uh, Translation Facebook, uh, for, which is their alumni network. Another model for this is you hire an outside expert network to tap talent, uh, and that can work as well, although it's not proprietary, if you become a client of GLG or GuidePoint or another. So another model of network, I, as a consultant, I built out Goldman Sachs Chamber Street Executive Network. Chamber Street Special Situations Group, which is a private equity group, they were clients of the major expert networks, but they didn't like the fact that by definition, everyone else could be clients of those expert networks. And they didn't have a priori trust with some random executive they were hooked up with via that network. So we built for them a very small pool, low double digits of senior executives uh, who were not paid by Goldman Sachs. The model was that we're gonna have a friendly relationship with you. We'll invite you to dinner once a year. You can put on your LinkedIn that you're a member of this network. When one of our portcos needs an interim board member or an interim exec, or we fire the CEO and we need to pop in a new CEO very quickly, you're gonna be on call. You are our go-to person for that. So that was a win-win and it was super cheap to do that. At my prior firm, Hoff Capital, uh, we built out a extremely impactful group of LPs uh, who were typically leading industrial families around the world, um, 70 family offices and high net, ultra high net worths from 21 countries. And that allowed us, that helped us in the fundraising, but it also helped us in the value creation process. If you want to do business in Egypt and Thailand and Lithuania, we were connected with the families that had a lot of influence in those countries. And that was very, very beneficial to our companies and a sales pitch that very few other firms could make. So those are the major levers. Let me quickly go through the three different models of how private equity and VC firms are using this. So the first is financier. The financier model is, hey, I'm a banker. I'm a money guy, right? I just put in the money and I don't do much else beyond that. The extreme example of this right now is the major hedge funds, Tiger Global and Co2, who are writing 50 to $100 million checks in sometimes one or two days. So uh, this is a somewhat controversial model, I, I will say, but these are very smart people. In the case of Tiger, it was 65 billion AUM, so they're doing something right. Uh, there's a great analysis I linked to here of the game that they're playing, which is quite different than the traditional model of VC. Uh, the intent here is they're obviously bullish on tech, and they just want to deploy capital as fast as possible. And they're comfortable with the fact that inevitably some of these will blow up because they're deploying so much capital that they hopefully are okay. Uh, this is a great chance for me to observe that valuations don't work the same way in this industry as they do in the public markets, right? Because these are all structured documents where really as long as a company exits at some number above whatever they put money in, they'll probably get their money back. So another case study, Correlation Ventures. So Correlation Ventures has built what they claim is the most extensive database in the industry of data about all the VC funds out there and partners' personal track records. And their model is they're an index fund. If you are raising a round and there is a new outside non-corporate investor, they will put in money that round very, very quickly. They again say, look, we, we try and be helpful, but we're not trying to add value here, right? Our goal is to be very easy to use, light touch, we'll put money in the round, done. And that's lower friction than a lot of other co-investors who want to do much more extensive DD. Lastly, I'll highlight right side capital management. This is a firm with four employees and they're making 75 to 100 investments per year, right? So that's a, an, an amazing ratio of investments per staff. And they're able to do that because they have a highly automated process, very metrics driven, uh, which incidentally has also resulted in a more diverse portfolio than average. Next model is a mentor model. This is probably the modal model, the most common model in, our, in the VC industry. So the model here is I'm the, VC, the CEO's consigliere. I apologize to the Italians on this for my accent. Uh, I'll help out, I'll be a board member, but it's basically me and maybe a secretary. So the, there are a number of solo GP firms where this is, they have some typically permutation of this model. And the GPs are usually very accomplished, very impactful individuals. But in most cases, they don't have a real platform in the way that we're describing. That's not what they're trying to do. So the last is platform, where you have a really thorough org chart supporting you and adding value. So Noam Wasserman, a dean of the YU SciSim School of Business, wrote his dissertation on, on the pyramid of venture capital. Most professional services firms, law firms, consultancies, they have a pyramid like that, right? VCs historically look like this. 
you have some partners and maybe you have a shared admin and that's it, right? That was the model for most of VC history and that's very unusual. So he wrote about why that is and he said, historically, the assumption was that GPs needed to be on top of all the information, the board meetings, all the engagement with the port codes. So there wasn't a lot of value in getting juniors involved because you'd have information loss. But of course, this is a less scalable model. Since 2005, when he wrote this paper, there's been an evolution. You do see more firms of the pyramid, although we are a long, long way from looking like McKinsey and the law firms. Uh, for example, in Dries Norwich, which has north of 100 staff, uh, and they have invested a lot of money uh, in building out a really, really thorough set of resources for helping their port codes, and seems to have worked out okay for them. Um, another firm that's invested a lot of energy here is First Round Capital, uh, which we talked about earlier. I'll also highlight what they call Yelp for Startup CEOs, which is a set of levers, uh, sorry, a set of um, uh, uh, databases around different players in the ecosystem. It's relatively easy to get recommendations, right? So-and-so is a really good lawyer. It's harder to get the dirt, right? Who should you stay away from? They harass people, they're low on ethics, right? Whatever, because that's sort of stuff people don't usually put publicly for obvious reasons. Um, but it's easier to get that when you're a member of a trusted gated community. So let me talk about some next steps. So there are five different resources you as an investor have to help your platform efforts, and I'll go through those. So first is cash. If you've got the cash, I think this is a win to invest in platform, right? As I said, one of the only two free launches in investing. If you don't have much cash, you can make intros, you can tap your network, that can work, and there are successful firms of that model, but you know, I prefer the model of a well-capitalized management company. Um, Next is brand. So if you've got a great brand, that's a uh, powerful asset. But of course, how do you get that brand? So you see some emerging VCs now being very aggressive in use of social media to raise their brand. And Dreesen Horowitz, their very first hire was Margit Wenemacher, apologies to the Germans on the call, uh, who ran one of the biggest PR firms in Silicon Valley, who, who knew the PR game cold, and that was very helpful to them in building up their firm. Next is network. So minimum, you've got to have a CRM system and uh, you need to track that data. Uh, and then your other resources, uh, I would suggest figure out the right outside service providers for your niche. So if you're an investor in climate tech, you want to know the lawyers, the consultants, et cetera, who specialize in that space and know them cold, they're going to be deal flow for you and they're going to help your port codes. So, an obvious question here is, I'm launching new VC, so what's my model? Well, I unfortunately don't have quite the cash resources of Andreessen Horowitz, so I'm, I'm a little more modest in my ambition, but there are a lot of things that we're doing, which are detailed on their website, to try and help our companies to lower origination costs. So we're, we do monthly check-ins with our founders, whether or not we have a board seat, to understand what's going on, and the intent is to have a pull model um, as opposed to a push model, right? We wanna encourage CEOs to reach out to us with their issues and we'll support them as necessary. We help in recruiting, particularly around diversity recruiting, because we think that there's a lot of undervalued talent that we can help our companies get engaged with. We help in identifying service providers and are pre-negotiating discounted rates with them. Skill building, because we want, we of course try to invest in the most competent management teams we can, but inevitably they're incomplete, right? We wanna support them build out the relevant skills. Uh, we help in customers and organize events. Another big in area of interest of us is the capital stack and how best to finance the company. We find most founders in VC default to traditional equity VC because that's what gets all the buzz. But that is not actually the optimal solution. There are a variety of new models out there, uh, revenue-based finance, flexible VC, which I wrote about for TechCrunch, which might reduce your dilution and better align incentives. So we work with founders to identify what form of financing makes sense given their particular situation. So over time, I certainly have ambitions to build out basically everything that I just talked about. I want to learn from my peers, replicate what I built at the two prior firms where I was partner and managing partner. But Versatile VC is still in launch phase, so I definitely have not built out all of this yet. But keep an eye on our site and you will see more to come. Uh, lastly, by the way, I should emphasize two resources that are free and live on our site. We have, we think, the best set of resources of free money. On our website, there's a button, free money. Guess what's the number one clicked button on our website? Free money. So if you're looking for free money, click on that link, and that is a whole set of resources of people who want to support your company at no cost to you. No equity dilution, 
no other obligation. Um, of course, they all have their own agenda, but there's a, a surprising number of resources out there of people who can help support you. Uh, there are also a variety of tools out there to provide free consulting, free advice. So I mapped all that. And second is we're launching a community for founders in transition. And our thesis there is whether you exit your company and you're independently wealthy or you shut it down and your spouse is saying, honey, can you get a job because we could use some health insurance? Um, whatever your situation is, that talent pool is of interest to me. I want to recruit them for my portcos or I want to back them in their next startup, depending on the dynamics. And so we have a whole set of resources at VersalVC.com to help founders in transition navigate their next move. So that concludes my formal presentation, high speed as promised. Uh, for the slide deck, click that link that you see there, uh, and you can follow up on our corporate and my personal website. I'd love to hear if any has questions and questions from anyone else in the audience. Great, thank you so much, David. I'm sure it really helped our listeners to structure their thoughts and ideas about value creation with the frameworks you shared. And now I would like to open the Q&A uh, session uh, with the audience. Please submit your questions in the Q&A uh, section of the Zoom. And also we wanna make it interactive. So we give you an opportunity to ask your question live, just be ready to unmute yourself. And while we wait for the questions to come in, I would like uh, David to ask you about your new book. Uh, many of our listeners today are students or alumni or just people who are wondering and rethinking their approach to education, in particular in light of the recent COVID-19 crisis. Could you tell us a bit more about new, your new book and how it might uh, help people and guide them in this process? Sure, so I just put in a link in the chat to the new book. Um, it's called To University and Beyond, Launch Your Career in High Gear. So when I was at Yale undergrad, um, I realized around junior year that I was kind of clueless. My father's an immigrant from Paris. My mother is a choreographer. Uh, my father's an artist. And I was surrounded by kids who went to Chode and Exeter and Andover, the, you know, high-end private schools. And they all were interning Goldman Sachs. And I thought Goldman Sachs made ladies' handbags, uh, which is what my father did. Uh, and so I sort of figured that out over time. And I said, you know what? I am very fortunate to go to this university, have the chance to get a good education. I wanna get maximum value from this. So I started taking notes on how to do this, how to do this most effectively. And I figured, you know what, hopefully I'll get married, have kids, and they should benefit. They should be smarter than me, which is not a high bar. So I kept accreting to it. And when I went to Harvard Business School, I did the same thing. I asked my classmates, what are you doing to take advantage of this exceptional honor and privilege of being educated at a top business school. And I kept accreting notes. So fast forward a decade or two, I now have four uh, kids and my oldest is 16. And I thought I should actually publish this. So I recruited his co-author, a friend of mine who runs one of the biggest admissions counseling businesses in the US. And uh, we published it a month ago from Wiley. Uh, and the book is a compilation of all of our best practices around how to accelerate your early career years. All the things I wish I had known in my early career and that I hopefully Hopefully my children will know. Also pro tip, your kids are more likely to read things when you give it to them as a book than when you lecture them. So I figured I'll give it to them as a nice book, nicely packaged, professionally edited, and they'll hopefully listen to it because it's difficult to get them to listen. It's a problem with teaching them to be entrepreneurs. Amazing. Well, we're all looking forward to reading uh, the book. Uh, so now we have some questions coming in. Um, uh, Joan Leung, would you like to ask your question live uh, if you're, uh, are there? If not, we can um, ask David directly. Maybe we'll give one second to Joan to un unmute themselves if they can hear us. All right, I think we, we just go ahead. Um, so Joan is wondering, what is your suggesting on finding co-founder? Uh, is that also hiring another co-founder you don't know? Because you mentioned before, you don't recommend uh, hiring people you don't know. Does it also extend to the uh, founder, founding team that you're building as a co-founder of this project? Yeah, so just to clarify, what I recommended is don't default to people you know, right? You should default, whatever your need is, you want a co-founder, you want a spouse, you want to hire someone, you should do a thorough search to find the most relevant person for your particular situation, right? And so I have a set of resources at my website around finding co-founders. Um, generically, in the case of co-founders, that is definitely a high stress situation where prior work history matters a lot. 
VCs are definitely going to look at it more favorably when you say, I worked together for the past two years with this person, as opposed to we got together last week. That said, there are numerous case studies of companies founded by co-founders who did not have prior work experience together. It can work, but you have to structure the company so there's some mechanism to divorce amicably. For example, you absolutely must have vesting with a minimum one-year cliff, um, and you must be able to hold one another accountable. And you certainly should spend a lot of time dating, quote unquote, before you commit to building the company together. Um, at my, my website, I have links to a couple of checklists around questions to ask your co-founder and assessing them to make sure that you are fit together to embark on what could be a 10-year journey together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. And um, kind of to follow up on, on this question, um, so we know that diversity is, uh, is obviously a big topic now in the VC and tech. So how do you go about um, nudging founders in that direction? And um, what is your recommendation? So uh, there's a group in the sponsored by the NVCA, National Venture Capital Association, called Venture Forward, which is focused on this specific issue. A um, couple things that I've done. So when I was, I founded Harvard Business School Angels New York, which is the largest angel group on the East Coast. Parenthetically, we have a sister chapter in London, which I believe is the most active angel group in London. Uh, and we, we in New York launched, we launched a survey of our members. We said, why are you angels? Do you want to give back? Do you want to mentor young people? Do you want to learn about new things? And the results of the survey from my fellow Harvard grads was, I'm looking for returns. I want returns. So I had a design problem which is most investment groups specialize by stage, sector, and or geography, but we're, we are an angel group, right? At HBS Angels, our members come from every possible industry, very, very international. A lot of them made their money in their career in some other country, and now they have ties to New York. And so it didn't make sense to specialize in the normal way that firms do. But I launched an initiative focused on women diverse founders because my argument was a lot of other investors are not recruiting, soliciting, marketing to this population. And if we do that, we will get opportunities to invest others don't. We'll have less competitive deal flow and we'll get better returns. So we launched a whole series of joint pitch events with the Harvard Business School, African-American alumni, Latino alumni, LBGT alumni, women's alumni, et cetera. Uh, we did not filter for Harvard affiliation. If anything, we had a bias against investing in the Harvard grads because of the ego problem and opportunity cost problem. Uh, but we knew that all these different groups were plugged into networks we were not members of. Uh, and they also were a way, this was a way that we could recruit new members into our angel group. So that was a successful initiative to create diverse deal flow. And in turn, that helped us identify new talent who we could introduce into our port coast. It's also a question that I'll bring up in board meetings is I'll say, gee, your management team looks really, really homogenous. Are you sure you mounted a thorough search for the best qualified person, or did you default to people you know because you're on the football team together or because you have some other affinity, right? So I think asking the question is a way to start. Lastly is metrics, right? Uh, ideally, you want to say this is one of the metrics we expect from you as an investor, just like we're tracking your revenues, profitability, da, 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 right? We want you to track diversity within the firm. Thank you so much for this, David. Um, so we have next uh, question from Thomas Pai, which uh, um, is quite related to what you just mentioned. Uh, Thomas, uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question live? I think we need one second to promote you to the speaker. One second. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, Sorry. I can hear you. No, thanks. Thanks a lot for for this great presentation. I just have a quick question. Do, do you by any chance uh, have evaluated which of these levers has the highest positive or, or negative by absence impact on, on a startup in terms of valuation? You know, uh, in terms of uh, also, you know, uh, basically saying, well, you know, we should focus uh, also maybe also uh, it depends on stage that, that you say, you know, you should focus on this and this lever and at this stage of the startup and on this and this lever on uh, at this stage of the startup. Thank you. Um, so it's hard to do this in a really rigorous way because there are too many variables. Uh, on slide five of the presentation, I highlight what we found to be 
the areas where we believe there's the highest ROI. Um, also, I wrote an article recently around launching a new Portco platform, uh, sorry, a new VC firm platform. Um, it's on slide 48. Uh, you can Google it, launching a portfolio acceleration platform at a VC or private equity fund. So what I did in that essay is walk through from highest ROI to lowest ROI, generically, the initiatives where you can have the biggest impact in your companies. So that hopefully addresses your question. Uh, great, thank you for that. And so next we have Gabriele uh, Dini who had a question um, as well. Uh, can we please promote Gabriele? Hi, Gabriele, you can unmute yourself, please. Hi again, yeah, yeah. I seen that being promoted, yay! Uh, thanks, David. Uh, I think it was it was uh, some very great, very useful insights. Uh, the, the real question here, from my perspective, is how much of what you have explained to everyone is is kind of portable across the pond, considering that, uh, of course, the U.S. is the most developed market for VC, but Europe is lagging behind from uh, from, from from that perspective. And, you know, after a couple of years in the industry, I, many things you have told us are resonating. Uh, other are a little bit, let's say, maybe ahead of where we are from a maturity perspective. So we covered um, international investors in our research study. I don't see any reason why you couldn't replicate this model in other geographies. And in fact, in some ways, it's more applicable. Um, so I lived in Israel for three years, and the typical dynamic for Israeli founders, no surprise, is they're well-networked in Israel, but they need help getting clients, getting talent outside of Israel. And so that's the sales pitch of virtually every VC in Israel, right, is we will help you get plugged into international networks. In fact, an interesting dynamic, when I lived in Israel, there's something like 90 local VCs. Since then, the tech ecosystem has absolutely exploded in Israel, right? Um, there, but the number of local VCs has actually gone down. Why? Because now top tier international VCs have offices in Israel because they all want to do business there and they have a more uh, viable sales pitch. When they say, hi, I'm a Silicon Valley VC and our partner in Israel is going to work with you as opposed to, hi, I'm a local Israeli VC. So um, I think that uh, you're in your local market, right, where you know the law, the language, et cetera, there's no reason you can't do the same things and serve this extremely important bridging function between the local market and the rest of the world. Great, very interesting. Uh, so we have um, next question from um, Arjun. We'll just... Um... Wait for one second for Arjun to be promoted to the speaker. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, um, thank you so much, uh, David. That was an excellent presentation. I just had a quick question. Um, I have a background in startups and VC in India, but I'm looking to break into a new geography. So essentially UK and Europe. Um, what advice would you give on how to go about breaking into the VC ecosystem in a new geography? Do you think cold emails or LinkedIn, any other resources that you know you could connect with people virtually or something? So the way I analyze this is first of all, what's your competitive advantage? And without knowing your whole bio, the most obvious one is you're networked in India, you know the culture, the law, et cetera. So I would first look for the uh, Indian corporates that are expanding or investing abroad or the VC firms that market as we are an Indian US firm, right? Kiwi Tech, which I mentioned earlier, which acquired my old spinoff, uh, which does exactly that and markets as we have an Indian technology development center and we'll help you build software for your startup in the US. So I would do that because if you, you apply for a job to just a random London VC, you're competing with everyone, right? But when you apply to Tata's corporate development arm, you have a, a value add that most of the other people in London don't have. Right. Secondly is when it comes to sales or job search, my model is always, how do I make people come to me instead of me going to them? So you can have a hundred coffee meetings in London, um, meeting with people, that's going to take you a long time. 
So what I would do is, re is, for example, if you went to LBS, go to the LBS Alumni Club and say, I want to organize a panel on Indian US VC. And you reach out to the three most prominent Indian US VCs or Indian UK VCs. You put together a panel. Who's going to show up for that panel? It's going to be 100 people interested in the India UK access. You're the organizer and moderator. You get asked the questions and you say, oh, and by the way, I'm in transition looking for a new job. So that's a much more efficient model than you having 100 coffee meetings is to make 100 people interested in the India UK access come to you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, great. Well, I think that's uh, been really helpful. And um, we have a question, uh, the last question, I think, because we're uh, running out of time uh, from Patern. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself, please? But Taryn, are you there? <laughs> and just a reminder, we will share all the slides um, afterwards, as well as all the resources that uh, David mentioned as a follow-up, as well as the recording of the session for anyone who couldn't join, like to share. Yes, hello. Yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, there was a network uh, no issues here. Yeah, uh, I had a question uh, is, it was basically about um, how do you attract um, VC capital into emerging markets, especially in Africa? Um, and how, how do you basically bridge the gap in, in funding? Do how do you add value to African startups? Yes, exactly. So at my old firm at Hoff Capital, my three partners who founded the firm are all natives of Cairo. So we're, we're we have a definite interest in Africa. I've invested in companies like Flutterwave, um, which are leaders in African tech. So generically, um, every region has its own challenges. Africa, of course, is a very, very, very diverse region. Um, I could say the same thing about India, right, which people say is not really one country. It's more like, you know, 50 different languages all under the umbrella of one country. Um, so, uh, so I think that it's hard to answer on a totally generic level. Um, what I will <clears throat> highlight is always identifying your comparative advantage. So if you look at Flutterwave, one of our portfolio companies, Flutterwave is a payments company focused on Africa, and they had this really interesting arbitrage in the firm's design, which is they had a technology team and leadership based in the US, but they were an African company, meaning selling to Africa, a big team in Africa. So they had this, the backing of US VCs, that valuation of a US company, but they had the lack of competition of an African tech company, right? The greenfield opportunity of African tech. And so that really worked out very, very well for them. Um, and that's a, a model I hope others can pursue. Great, well, thank you so much. I think we're running out of time, but we promised you a little surprise in the end. And so we have uh, uh, the winners of our uh, contest for the best uh, questions. So we have uh, Gabriele, Joan, and Arjun. And uh, the prize is the David new book. So we will um, reach out to you uh, with the details how to get the book, but we're very excited. Thank you so much, David. It's been uh, really insightful. And thank you so much to our audience for listening and for very thoughtful questions. And we will share all the materials afterwards. Um, thank you so much, David, and have a great rest of the conference. You still have two amazing panels this afternoon. Thank you all. Thank you so much for having me and feel free to reach out to me via my website. Take care and good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye.